thanks everyone for coming to this virtual CMSC meeting. Uh, I've changed the content of my original presentation to be something a little more practical and a little bit more uh, relevant in clinical practice since this is a different format and virtual format. So my name is Dr. Sarah Morrow. I'm a neurologist and the director of the London Ontario MS Clinic in Canada. Uh, I also have an MS cognitive clinic. I have a specific interest in cognition, um, both from a clinical and a research point of view. So today um, I'm going to do a clinician's approach to cognition and MS, something that I'm hoping is relevant and practical for you. So first, of course, before we get started, we need to talk about the fact that this is accredited. So this is how you would get your credits if you are a physician and how you get your credits if you're a nurse. On this page, we have how you would get your credits if you're a PA, a psychologist, or a social worker. We'll just leave it there for a second. Okay. Uh, of course, I need to give you my disclosures. Uh, so just as a quick uh, disclosure, I've had relationships with most of, the, uh, most of the pharma companies, but I won't be talking about those today, so they won't have any um, conflict of interest today with my presentation. So the objectives for today is to talk about how cognitive impairment presents in persons with MS. And this is meant to be how you might see them when you're in clinic, in an MS clinic evaluating patients, not necessarily with a psychologist or a, um, a cognitive clinic per se, but more how to deal with it when you're in clinic. To recognize the impact of cognitive impairment on the lives of persons with MS um, and basically why this is important. And then talk about some treatment strategies that you could perhaps apply in the clinical setting. So I just like to start with two cases. I find that it's always helpful to kind of see it in a real life setting to bring home the importance of these symptoms. So this is one of my patients, a 39 year old right-handed lady who was divorced. She had two teenage sons. She was diagnosed with relapsing MS in 2006. She had two relapses that year and no further relapses until February of 2013. And it was at that point that she started on Avenex. Before I saw her in my MS cognitive clinic, her EDSS was 1.5. So she had a low physical disability. She was working full time as a postal worker um, and she completed a one-year college diploma after high school. So when I saw her in 2015 in my cognitive clinic, she re uh, reported one year of symptoms. She said that she was having trouble finding the right words or following conversations with friends. She'd actually become hesitant to talk in group conversations and actually been avoiding them because she was worried that she would say the wrong thing or she would have to stop paying attention to the conversation to think what she wanted to say and thus could not participate. It had become an issue at home as well in that uh, she was forgetting quite a bit of things and her kids were becoming frustrated. The night before our appointment, she'd actually forgotten parent-teacher night and her younger son was really excited for her to meet his teacher. So that was quite disappointing for him and it bothered her that she forgot something so important to her son. Both of her kids were active in what's called travel hockey. So uh, it's a big thing in Canada that kids have different levels of hockey. And so with travel hockey, um, it's very competitive. And if you don't show up to practices, you don't get to play in the game. And she kept forgetting to take her sons to their practices, such to the point where her husband, when she had the kids, her ex-husband would text her a reminder of the games about 30 minutes before or else she would forget. And this is despite the fact that she was making lists and putting things on calendars. Now, she didn't think that this was affecting her at home, and she thinks that's partly because her job was quite routine and she was able to compensate for any issues. So these are her cognitive test results. So I'm just gonna walk you through it quite um, quickly. So these, these two measures right here are measures of processing speed. Right here are measures of memory. Right here are measures of higher executive function. This is verbal fluency at the beginning, and at the end we have selective attention. What you're looking at is a graph of normalized scores. So zero means that's normal. So we take her score and we compare it to the uh, population and what would be considered normal or abnormal, zero being average. So anything above zero is above average, anything below zero is below average. And these are standard deviations below the, the mean. So you can see here that she was three standard deviations below the mean on one of two tests of processing speed. Now don't get fooled by the fact that there's no bar here. The reason there's no bar here is because she was so impaired, she couldn't actually do that test. So she's actually quite impaired in that area. And then on measures of memory, she was, uh, would be considered impaired in this area 
because we use 1.5 standard deviations below the mean to indicate impairment. So this is the other area she had impairment was memory. Here's a second case uh, in contrast. So this is an older gentleman, 61 year old with secondary progressive MS. He had not been diagnosed with relapsing MS until 2002. He'd actually had an optic neurase at the age of 15 and was lost to follow up after that. Of course, there was no MRIs at that time. Uh, in retrospect, he'd likely had a second relapse at the age of 24 with sensory only symptoms that lasted for about two weeks and then resolved on their own and he did not seek medical attention at the age of 24. His third event in 2002 is what led to the MRI leading to his MS diagnosis. And shortly thereafter, he did enter into a secondary progressive phase. His main symptoms from his MS were his fatigue, some paresthesias and sensory loss, as well as some bladder urgency. His only medication was occasionally some modafinil for his fatigue. And his EDSS about six months before I saw him in the MS cognitive clinic was 5.0. So a higher level of disability than our last patient. He had completed a bachelor's degree and he continued to work full time as a city planner. So this is a busy slide, but I'll walk you through it. So when I met him, in contrast to our last lady, he felt that this was only an issue at work and was not an issue in his personal life. He was noticing that he was redoing tasks a second or third time, two to three days later, because he'd forgotten he'd already completed the task. When I asked him if he'd completed it correctly, both times he had, so he was still able to do it, he just completely forgot he did it and would redo the task. He noticed that after a big meeting, the next day he would not remember what he would put in his re reports or his briefs, even though he'd completed it appropriately. His boss was who was also one of his close friends, had noticed he was struggling, but they were the same age and he just said, you know, it's just due to our age, we're getting older, we're not as, we're not as sharp as we used to be. But my patient felt that it was more than that. He hadn't missed any deadlines at work, but that was because he was quite diligent and he was actually uh, putting things in triplicate. He put notifications on his work computer, he write it down in his handheld uh, calendar. And he was also putting reminders on his home computer. As I said, he really didn't think that this was affecting his personal life. He still enjoyed reading, gardening, and participating in his church. But when I really dug into it, he did say that he'd always been a history buff and he quite liked reading historical novels. But now he was having trouble relating new books he was reading to preview books he was reading in terms of geography or certain incidents. And that was unusual for him. So when I dug a little bit deeper into that, he did say that his kids were noticing he was having trouble with word finding, that his speech was not as smooth. And he'd actually forgotten to turn off the coffee maker so frequently that he now made sure he unplugged it from the wall before he left the house just to make sure it was off. So let's look at his cognitive tests now. So similar to the last test uh, results, zero is normal. So that's what we consider the average. These are normalized tests. Anything below the mean is, uh, or below average, anything below, uh, above zero is above average. Oops, there we go, sorry about that. Um, and what we considered impaired is anything 1.5 standard deviations below the mean. So in contrast to our last lady, he's only mildly impaired on one of two measures of processing speed. In contrast, he had significant impairment in measures of memory. So you can see here he's 4.1 and 4.7 standard deviations below the mean. And of course his executive function is still intact, Although I wonder, based on his history and his previous uh, function, if that might be a below uh, his regular norm, that he was actually, if I tested him perhaps at the time of his diagnosis, or even when he had his first symptoms, that these measures would have been higher and we're having a decrease in his function that is not meeting the criteria for abnormal. So just two cases to kind of illustrate how the presentations can differ and how the presentations uh, can be quite subtle. So, Kind of just going back to basics, what is cognition? So if you look it up in the Webster Dictionary, it's simple, it just says mental processes. The Oxford Dictionary is a little bit more detailed saying the faculty of knowing or perceiving things. Another definition could be processes involved in acquiring and understanding knowledge, memory, and concentration. So what we consider higher level brain functions. And more simply, it's how we think, plan, remember, and understand our environment. The first real uh, delving into cognition as a symptom in multiple sclerosis was done by Dr. Steve Rayo and published in 1991 in the Journal of Neurology. In this sample, he looked at 100 people with MS who had a known diagnosis. Of course, that was based on poser criteria, so they might be a little later in their diagnosis than what we might see now. 
Uh, the 39 of them were relapsing MS, the rest were progressive, and that was compared to 100 healthy controls. He excluded those who had severe motor or visual impairment, meaning they wouldn't be able to participate in the testing battery. On average, since diagnosis was nine years, since symptom onset was 14. So that's probably a little bit more in keeping with what we would see today. So this is around 14 years since diagnosis for us. And on average, the education was 13 years. So most had achieved some level of higher education. Based on his testing, which was quite extensive, he found that 43% were cognitively impaired. When you look at other studies, so those who are perhaps in an MS clinic or hospital-based samples, have found the prevalence to be as high as 65%. So anywhere from 43 to 65% is the prevalence of cognitive impairment in persons with MS. So how does this present? So they tend to find that they have difficulty with verbal and visual memory, so they complain of forgetfulness trouble with attention, so they are easily distracted, trouble with processing information, so slow pro information processing speed, so they're not able to perform tasks as quickly, or they have problem performing multiple tasks or shifting attention, so multitasking. Executive function or problem solving, so they have trouble with uh, solving thought problems, or they might be rigid in their problem solving, a little less flexible mentally. And visual di spatial dysfunction is also pro uh, difficulty with recognition, as well as difficulty completing a hand-eye coordination or difficulty with planning something that's quite visual. In terms of how frequently these present in people with MS, this is probably a slide that many of you have seen before. So I'll just quickly go over it, is the most common presentations is memory, both immediate and delayed memory. So that learning component, taking it in, as well as that recall, bringing it back, and processing speed. We also do see problems with verbal fluency, but less frequently. Concept formation being uh, executive function, also less frequently. So I'm just going to delve a little bit more into memory and processing speed, since that's how uh, most people with MS present, is difficulties with memory and processing speed. So just to Break it down quite simply is memory can be broken down into encoding. So you actually have to get that information in. Consolidation, where you actually have to transfer the information from your working memory into long-term storage. And then the last component is retrieval. So once you've laid down the memory, you have to be able to retrieve it. And you can think of it as either free recall or recognition memory. And I like to think of this as free recall would be an essay, recognition would be a multiple choice question just to give you an idea of the difference between those two types of uh, retrieval. So people with MS who have trouble with learning and memory, they tend to have more difficulty learning it, so the acquisition of the information, than retrieving it. Now, of course, when you're doing formal tests like you were just seeing, if you can't lay it down, you can't bring it back. So often there is impairment on those tests of retrieval simply because they weren't able to lay it down in the first place. It is the most frequent complaint that we see and I think that's partly because it's easy to recognize in day-to-day -day life. If you're forgetting things, it's easy for that to let you know that you're having a problem. Subjective things people might tell you in clinic is they're having trouble learning new things. So maybe there's a new computer program at work and they're just not learning it as well as they used to be able to. Forgetting what was said in a conversation, forgetting why you entered a room, although it happens to all of us, but a little bit more frequently or pathologically, and forgetting appointments or planned tasks. Next, we have information processing speed and selective attention, which are kind of two sides of the same coin. So with processing speed, there's a decrease in the speed of which they can process information. And this is what we find most frequently impaired on formal testing. So although memory is the biggest complaint, when we do testing, we often see it more frequently impaired on processing speed. So people will often say, I can do everything I used to be able to do, I just need more time. So people might say, I need to come in an hour early or stay an hour late at work to be able to do the same amount of work I used to be able to do. It does mean they have decreased productivity and they're often slow to respond when information is provided. And this also leads to difficulty with multitasking. Similarly, attention is being able to focus on one thing and ward out distractions. So people have trouble with uh, difficulty screening out distractions. So if they're working on something and the phone rings or their uh, email chimes off, they have trouble getting back on their task and they have difficulty with divided attention. And of course, the three interplay. So if you have difficulty processing new information, you're going to have trouble acquiring that knowledge and then laying it down as a new memory. Additionally, processing speed and poor attention or concentration lead to difficulty with mental flexibility. 
So it's harder dealing with those interruptions and a hard shifting between tasks or different conversations. So there's, you're not able to really say that any of them affect people in a vacuum, that they all do interplay with each other. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to tease out what actually the issue is. Verbal fluency. This is important to think about because MS does not affect language. So in contrast to the traditional uh, dementias that we see in neurology, which is really the, the, what I like to call the A's, the agnosia, the aphasia, the apraxia, language is not affected in MS. So you don't see aphasias and you don't see agnosias. But people with MS often complain of difficulty with their language. And that's really more because it's verbal fluency. It's not a language issue, it's being able to come up with the right word. So they'll say that they're the words at the tip of the tongue or they're trying to remember something and they can come up with that person's name or the word. And interestingly, although it's a common complaint, if you remember back to the graph we saw earlier, verbal fluency is not frequently affected. Those who complain of verbal fluency, often you see that their processing speed is affected. So they have trouble processing that information quickly which then leads to not feeling as if they can come up with the right word. So how does this present in a person with MS? So most frequently it tends to come on slowly, which means that it's often hard to notice it. So if you think back to the two cases I showed, both of those patients, despite really only complaining of things for the last year or so, had already had significant impairment in certain areas. In um, the first lady, quite impaired in uh, processing speed, and in the gentleman, Quite impaired in memory and yet they were only presenting when it was that severe and that's because it because it comes on slowly it's often hard to notice it or it's easy to blame it on other things so it could be that you're busy at work you're busy with kids and activity or perhaps with a gentleman you just think it's part of normal aging and often by the time I see people in clinic they've already come up with tricks to compensate so I'll say do you often forget appointments and they'll say oh no I never forget appointments but when you dig in, they say, oh, well, that's because I have to use my calendar. So if you didn't use your calendar, would you remember? Not at all. If I don't write it down, I'm not going to, I'm not going to remember. People have already come up with compensatory techniques. And I'm going to talk about this a bit later is new research is showing that it can be involved in relapses. So although the majority of people have a slow, insidious onset, it can also be worsened by relapses. It's also quite frequently present at baseline uh, at, at the time of diagnosis. So in our clinic, I have the luxury of being able to do a full cognitive battery on all newly diagnosed people with MS. So once that diagnosis is made, within three to six months of the diagnosis, we do a full cognitive assessment. So this is just data looking at all of our baseline patients, all the patients who had new diagnosis and testing. And you can see the average scores here and the percent that were impaired. And most frequently it was on measures of processing speed. So the symbol digit modalities test, and the paste auditory sim, uh, serial addition test or the most frequent measures of, of impairment. Next, of course, as we were talking about earlier, was most frequently was memory. So the first is verbal memory, both immediate and delayed recall. So learning and retrieval. With the BBMT is visual spatial memory. Again, immediate and delayed recall. And of course, less frequently, we have impairment of executive function and verbal fluency. This is just presenting it in graphic form in a little bit different way, looking at the number of patients who were impaired. So looking at the percentage, I guess I should say instead. <clears throat> so here on the number of tests impaired, you can see that 37%, only 37% were not impaired on any test. Of course, some tests measure, uh, more than one test measures the same thing as you can see from table two over here. So then you can look at it down here and look at it in terms of domains. And of course it's the same, that 37% are not impaired on anything. And 33% were impaired on at least one test, sorry, one domain. So that means that at least one third of patients at the time of diagnosis are already showing impairment in one domain. And that's quite significant. What makes it difficult sometimes to recognize in clinic is that it has a weak correlation with physical disability. So this is an excellent study done by Dr. Amato and published in Neurology. And what she did is she looked at patients who were were labeled under the old term, which we don't use anymore, which is benign MS. So benign MS was defined as people who had little or no physical disability. So an EDSS less than three, 15 years after diagnosis. And of course, this would have been back when POSER criteria is used. And you can see down in the graph below that the 
EDSS was quite low. So this was a very physically able group of people with MS. And yet, despite that, uh, most of the patients, there was quite a significant number of patients who were impaired. So this is cognitively preserved and cognitively in, uh, impaired. So you can see 11 out of the sample, so about one third, despite being physically able or benign MS, had cognitive impairment. So it's not always correlating with physical activity, making it more difficult to recognize in clinic. If you look at the different subtypes, you really see it in all subtypes. In clinically isolated syndrome, if you were to test them, you still see it in a third, relapsed and remitting a bit more. And of course, secondary and primary progressive, you see it in a higher number. And what we don't fully understand is if that's part of the actual disease process, or is that because, uh, especially with secondary progressive, that they may have disease for longer, and with that pro insidious progression, does that cause more cognitive impairment? And what's concerning is that in the first five years after the diagnosis is when you see a, a significant increase in the level of cognitive impairment. So in this study, what they found is that baseline, only a third were impaired, so similar to the studies that already presented. But after five years of a known diagnosis of MS, that jumped up to 50%. So one in two persons with MS will have some degree of cognitive impairment. Uh, similarly, uh, Dr. Romano did a study that followed patients for three years, and she followed 45 people for over 10 years. And of course, this was back in with closer criteria. And at that time, she found that uh, three quarters were cognitively intact at the time of diagnosis. However, over 10 years, that decreased to 44%. So similar to the five-year data, it's one in two will be impaired at five and 10 years. And interestingly, no one showed any improvement over time, meaning that once it's present, it is going to continue to be present. So why do we care? If it does, it needs to have an impact on your quality of life in order for it to matter. And the reason we care is it does have a significant impact on quality of life. So people with MS who have cognitive impairment have lower self-esteem and higher rates of divorce. It's an invisible symptom, so it's often not understood by partners. It also has impairment, uh, it also impairs their family life or their social relationships. So if you remember back to my first case, she was avoiding going to social groups because she was worried that she wouldn't be able to contribute or she would say something that sounded stupid. Additionally, people with MS are more like, who are cognitively impaired are more likely to have car accidents, more likely to have the inability to be fit to drive. And of course, this may be needed for employment as well as uh, leading to loss of independence. Additionally, it's known to have a significant impact on employability. So this was a study looking at patients who stayed cognitively intact versus those who had, a, who, sorry, who had employment intact, meaning they didn't have any change in their employment status, compared to those who had a change in their employment status over time. The liberal definition was any change in employment status, whereas the conservative said going from fully employed to fully unemployed and on disability. So that's the difference between the conservative and the liberal. And what you can see is that those who um, went from being employed to less employed or employed to not employed had significant worsening of their cognitive change, of their cognitive tests over time. In contrast, those who stayed at con um, employment intact were able to show some practice, effects when, practice effect when they were doing their tests. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to return to the relapse data. So this is a newer phenomenon, well, and I guess not so much newer phenomenon, but newly identified phenomenon. Uh, the, we looked at uh, the Strata database, which is a prospective natalizumab study. It was back when PML was first described, and at that time they were looking at ways that we could identify PML early. So in this study, patients were getting the SDMT administered every time they went to their natalizumab um, infusion which gave a wealth of data in order to be able to measure serial SDMT administration. In the database, we were able to identify those who had relapses, excluding those who had optic neuritis because it would affect the test. And we matched them to controls who had not had a relapse based on time from entering the study, their age, and of course their baseline SDMT performance. So you can see at the beginning, they are well matched on their SDMT. You can look at the numbers here at the bottom, pre means before the relapse, post means after the relapse. So these are the times they had their natalizumab infused for 
and after the relapse. So right here is approximately where the relapse happened. And you can see those who had the, had, did not have a relapse continue to show mild practice effect with each administration. In contrast, those with, who had had a relapse, even if they weren't complaining of cognitive issues, had a decrease in their STMT performance overall with them some, with some remission thereafter, similar to what we'd see with physical symptoms. We, uh, uh, we redid the study, but prospectively instead of retrospectively. So trying to identify patients as they were having the relapse and then following them over time. And we included only those who had baseline testing so we could look at how they changed over time. Uh, similarly, we did matching. And you can see similar to the last uh, diagram I showed you that those who did not have a relapse had some slight practice effect over time. In contrast, those who had a relapse had a significant drop in their SDMT with some remission over time. So that's why it's important to look into cognition, but now how do we do that in clinic? So how do we use these cognitive batteries in clinic? As I mentioned earlier, neuropsychology is quite involved and often not accessible to many of us in clinic. So we need to think about how we can practically apply this in our clinics. So first, why do we need to follow this up? Well, that's because sometimes, similar to what I was describing in my second case, sometimes people will have a decrease from a previously higher baseline that does not quite meet the criteria for cognitive impairment. So as you can see in this diagram here, if someone started quite high on the bell curve, so again, this is zero for the mean, if they started quite high and notice a decrease in their performance, if we only tested them at this one time, we would say they were cognitively normal because they were at the mean. But for them, it's no longer their normal, that they've had a significant decrease over time. So it's really important to do serial testing. It's one of the reasons we like to do testing at baseline so that we can monitor changes over time. So a patient may still complain of something and we don't pick it up if you only do a snapshot in time or just a cross-sectional assessment. Similarly, this study showed that the cognitive impairment in MS is progressive and changes the most in those who are unimpaired at baseline. So it's, you don't wanna wait until they're complaining of symptoms to get a good assessment because otherwise you're not going to be able to monitor changes over time. So when should you screen for it? So I've already alluded to this, that I'm a big believer in doing screening at baseline because if you don't do it at baseline, you're not gonna be able to do changes over time. And patients are quite open to it. When we talk to them about it, we say this is kind of like getting an MRI. So you have an MRI baseline. In order to monitor how you're doing, you need a second MRI to see if anything new develops. Same thing we do with the cognitive tests. And that makes a lot of sense to them. And people who you consider stable, I would not recommend doing the test every year. The reason is, is that there is significant practice effect, as you can see from the uh, stable groups when you're looking at the relapse data. So over time with each, each administration, people get a bit better with it. And I give the example of, well, if you remember when you were in school, sometimes you did well on multiple choice questions simply because you learned how to do multiple choice questions well. You may not have known the information, but suddenly you knew how to do them. Similar to essay writing, you knew how to structure it so it became easier for you and you performed better. It wasn't that you were any smarter, but just you learned how to play the game in a sense. Um, so you don't wanna have too much practice effect or you may miss the opportunity to see changes over time. So I really only recommend in those who you consider stable to do it every two to three years. If there are other changes such as a relapse or changing in medication or perhaps some other changes that people have noticed that they don't think they're doing as well or you wonder if there's been changes, then it'd be important to do cognitive testing at that time. Now, of course, up until now, I've been presenting you the full, uh, full MacPhims data uh, database or um, assessment tool, which is not practical in clinic. First, you need someone to be who, has to, who can administer it. And of course, it is time consuming, taking about an hour and a half. So one of the batteries that I often recommend is the BICAMS, and many of you are probably familiar with it. The BICAMS is a measure of uh, processing speed using the symbol digit modalities test, as well as using the immediate recall measures of verbal and visual spatial memory. So if you recall, what we talked about earlier is that processing speed and memory, specifically learning or immediate recall, is what is most frequently impaired in people with MS. Thus, this screening battery catches the majority of patients. Of course, it is just screening. You are going to miss those who may have impairment in other areas. And in terms of a screening test, it's quite useful. It does take anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how easy it is for you to administer it. But it can sometimes be incorporated into clinic. 
However, if that is too much, it is too time consuming in your clinic or you don't have someone who can administer it, that at least this STMT should be used. It is a really easy test to administer. It takes less than five minutes. It's very easy to learn. And it has been found to be reliable over time with multiple administrations that the practice effect does a flat plateau over time. And changes on the STMT have been associated with clinically meaningful changes or clinically meaningful outcomes similar to losing employment or relapses. So this is something that's quite easy to incorporate into the clinical setting, especially if it's not being necessarily done at every clinic visit. So what do you do with it when you find a problem with cognition? Of course, we don't really have any treatments that have been fully um, effective for reversing cognitive impairment, but you can identify other factors that can affect cognition. And I'm not gonna talk about it much in the slides, but don't forget about relapses. If we are preventing relapses, we are in some ways preventing the cognitive impairment that accumulates from relapses. So I'm not gonna talk about DMTs today, but I did want to bring that up. So the important things to do is identify other factors that could affect cognition. So other things you can address and treat in clinic. And then some techniques that you can help them cope with the issues or behavioral techniques that can help minimize the impact that cognitive impairment is having on their day-to-day -day life. So first, I want to talk about anticholinergic medications, because this has been talked about quite a bit in the context of dementia, but very infrequently in people with MS. So we know that anticholinergic medications are used quite frequently in people with MS because of bladder dysfunction. Bladder dysfunction is very common in people with MS. Some studies report up to 90% of people are affected. So anticholinergic medications are quite frequent. A Cochrane Review in 2009 recommended oxycontinin and tolteridine be used for, uh, for bladder dysfunction in persons with MS. And these are both anticholinergic medications. So we know it helps with their bladder, but we also know that anticholinergic medications can cross the blood-brain barrier and act on the muscarinic receptors that they act on in the bladder on the receptors that are also in the brain. But really, no studies had really been done to see if it does affect cognition in persons with MS. So we decided to take that on. This is just a quick screen of what we did. So anyone who was going on a bladder medication because they needed it, so we weren't just giving people bladder medications or any cholinergics for no good reason. Only if they were going on it for bladder symptoms did we then ask, would you also like to participate in this study looking at potential cognitive effects? So uh, we did match them to a control group. They were matched on baseline, co um, baseline cognitive tests. They are uh, matched on age. So baseline STMT, I should clarify, just the STMT, baseline age, as well as gender. So we had uh, quite a few dropouts, unfortunately, which happens with most studies. And I always like to put these slides up so people understand how much work it can be to go to enroll patients in studies, even one as simple as this, where they were simply getting testing at baseline, and then three months later, either on a treatment or a matched control group. So what we see here is what happened to the SDMT. And this study really emphasizes the importance of having a control group whenever you're doing a cognitive study. Because if we had only tested those who went on the anticholinergic, you can see that their scores stayed about the same. If you had just looked at this, you would have said, mm, probably doesn't have any effect. But in contrast, those who did not have the anticholinergic medication showed regular practice effect quite you know, over three months quite a bit. So you can see that there's a significant difference between these two, meaning the anticholinergic is having a blunting of that learning response. We saw the same finding with the uh, BBMT, which is a measure of the visual spatial memory. Again, the effect was blunted in those who are on anticholinergics, the practice effect, and similarly on the verbal memory measure. And this was significantly different in all three groups. So based on these studies, we now try to avoid anticholinergic medications in our patients, especially those who already have cognitive impairment. Now, of course, there always is the balance of risk and benefit. So if really the only medication working for them is this anticholinergic, then explaining the risk of potential side effects is important, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't use it. Having said that, we do have other options that are not any cholinergics, and using those might be a good idea in patients who have cognitive impairment or you're worried about their cognitive function. So this is just one way to try and protect someone's cognitive function. Another is mood symptoms. So I'm sure any of you working with people with MS know that this is very common. The lifetime prevalence is 35% for anxiety and up to 50% for depression. And it's higher than what you see in other chronic neurological illnesses. So it's not just that they have a neurological illness and it's not just a grieving process. There seems to be something else that puts them at higher risk for mood symptoms. In the general population, so people who do not have MS, we know that 
depression can worsen their cognition. So there have been, they have shown that it worsens their memory, processing speed, and executive function. There have only been a few studies done in persons with MS, and it, in those studies, it seemed to think that the worsening of cognitive function with depression in MS was really only in those with moderate to severe depression. In contrast, it's been well known with studies to date showing that both anxiety and depression make people with MS subjectively think that they're cognitively impaired. So what we wanted to do is see if there was any correlation between mood and cognition. So we, uh, well, before we get into that, I'm just going to show you a quick case because I think this quite illustrates the, uh, the, uh, the interaction between mood and cognition. So this is another case of mine, a 33-year-old lady who had been diagnosed with MS in 2009. She was on Copaxone shortly after diagnosis. And I saw her in the MS Cognitive Clinic in January of 2012 because she had memory complaints. She told me she felt as if her brain was tired. She was working as a security guard and became quite frustrated if too many things were happening at once. She'd had an unofficial reprimand by her supervisor at work who told her she needed to slow down. Her partner noticed difficulty with multitasking, that stressful situations were winder, would wind her up. And they gave me a really interesting example where they had been at New Year's Eve party and they had decided to play poker. And my patient had never played poker before, so she tried to learn it. And she had a hard time learning the rules which both she and her partner felt was unusual for her. So again, we can look at this, these tests and you can see that she is showing significant impairment. Um, if you look at the zero, which is again the mean, so what we consider average, she's impaired on measures of processing speed, the simple digit modalities test. She's borderline abnormal on measures of memory and significantly impaired on measures of executive function. And certainly that seems to fit with what she's describing. So she's describing difficulty with problem solving and she's had describing difficulty with processing information. But her Breedy IFS, which is a screening test for depression, demonstrated that she had moderate impairment, no, sorry, moderate depression. So my thought was, well, let's try and treat this depression and see what happens. So she was treated with uh, deloxetine first on 30 and then increased to 60. And I, she was retested one and a half years later. At this time, her BDIFS was down to one, indicating she was no longer impaired, uh, no longer depressed. I also had added the HADS, which is another measure of depression, but also includes anxiety. Her depression score was four and her anxiety score was seven, which are both considered normal. Now on the, uh, on the graph below, her original testing, which you just looked at, is in light gray, and her retesting is now in dark gray. So her, her not only has her, depression improved significantly, so have many of the measures. Specifically, if you look here at executive function, she's now within normal limits. Same with her memory, she's now within normal limits. In contrast, she's still showing impairment in processing speed, if not a bit worse. So what she and I took away from this is that most of her cognitive complaints were due to her actual depression. And when we improved her depression, we were able to improve many of her cognitive functions. Uh, cognitive domains and cognitive function. In contrast, we felt that her processing speed impairment was most likely due to her MS, and then we addressed it that way. So just a little bit more. One case is, of course, just an N of one. So what we wanted to do is look at uh, a larger sample. So we looked at 100, uh, just over 150 people with MS, and we looked at uh, objective cognitive tests compared to their presence of anxiety or depression based on the HADS. So what we did is we looked at those who were HADS positive for depression versus those who were HADS negative for depression and the same thing for anxiety. So what you can see here is those who were uh, depressed had significantly lower scores on the simple digit modalities test. Similarly, they had worse performance on delayed recall or that retrieval with visual spatial memory and on measures of a higher executive function. Similarly with anxiety, we saw that those who had anxiety based on the HADS were worse on their performance on the PASAT, another measure of processing speed as well as working memory, and both measures of visual spatial memory, both immediate recall and delayed recall. So it's important though in this to remember that this is not causative, this is correlative. It's just saying that if they have depression, they're more likely to have lower scores on, on these cognitive domains. It doesn't mean cause and effect at this point. And that has not been well studied in the MS population. Finally, moving on to other things that we can help with. So one of the things I end up doing the most in my clinic is talking about behavioral techniques. So this doesn't fix the underlying problem, but it does help them cope with it. So this is something we do quite frequently. 
So with memory tricks and aids, the biggest thing we do is using their smartphone. We live in an age where everyone seems to have a smartphone um, and you can use that to help remind you. So you can have, you can uh, put appointments right on your phone. You can set reminders. Um, and if you don't have a smartphone, you can always keep a small notebook with you and write things down and which I commonly see in some of my patients to help improve concentration and attention. What you want to do is try and minimize distractions as well as um, minimize interruptions. So if you're doing something important, you might want to talk the radio off, uh, turn the radio off. Well, I apologize. Or if you're working on an important task, turn off your uh, email notification or turn off the ringer on your phone or text notifications. That way you can concentrate on the task at hand and you don't need to worry about being distracted and trying to shift your attention between things. You want to avoid interruptions. So if it's something important, sometimes closing the door, if that's something that you're able to do, as well as to give yourself extra time to take in the information. Studies have shown that people with MS who have trouble with processing speed can still do the task if you give them extra time to process the information. So I often tell my patients to ask that information be repeated or that it be sent to them in another form, whether it be a list written out, if it's a grocery list you need to do or tasks you need to do on the way home from work, or if it's something important, have the person text it to you or send you an email. And certainly that's where iPhones come in that's quite helpful because often people can send things to your calendar and you don't even need to worry about processing it or remembering it, it'll go right on your calendar for you. And of course, avoiding multi-sense input. You really wanna focus on one task at a time. And these can make a significant difference in people with MS. They do notice that this improves their ability to function day to day. What about exercise? Uh, there's lots and lots to talk about exercise. And this was a really well done systematic review of the studies to date looking at exercise. Uh, the unfortunate thing is it wasn't too revealing in the sense that they didn't find any clear indication that it was effective. So when they looked at chronic exercise, so people who were incorporating exercise into their weekly routine, essentially the studies were mixed. We, they may have helped, they may not have helped. So essentially the systematic review stated that they do not know if chronic exercise can help. Physical activity, so this is looking at how physically active you are on a day-to-day -day basis, um, found that it's possibly effective. So they considered it level C evidence that is effective. Similarly, looking at fitness level, so how well you are in terms of your fitness, also found that it was possibly effective. So what this to me says is that it may help, we just don't have the studies to support that. So the lack of evidence doesn't mean lack of benefit. It just means that we need to do more studies looking at it. And I think what was most important is none of the studies found that it was harmful. So we know that exercise helps patients do all sorts of other things. It helps with their uh, fatigue. It helps with their mood. It helps with keeping their uh, spasticity at bay. So since it helps all those things, and it may also help with our cognition, it's something I still do recommend. So this brings me to the end of my talk. And I hope you've learned through today's presentation that quality of life in MS is more than just simply relapses in physical ability. That cognition has a huge impact on quality of life in people with MS, and also has a huge impact on their self-esteem. It's under-recognized and under-addressed in most MS clinics, clinics. So it's very important to ask about it and screen for it. Not just asking the patients if they're noticing symptoms, but actually doing some sort of objective screening measure. Because by the time they're complaining about it, they may already be significantly impaired, as you can see with the first two cases I showed you. And although, although variably effective, there are some interventions that can help people with coping with it, or perhaps decrease the risk of worsening cognitive impairment, by avoiding other things that can worsen cognition, such as anticholinergics, um, as well as treating mood symptoms, as well as preventing relapses, and then also prevent, providing with behavioral techniques and perhaps exercise to help improve their cognition. So that is the end of my talk, and I hope that it was helpful, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the CMSC. Thank you.